Welcome to the Luke Yeager Show. My guest tonight is Mike DeSalvo, former vocalist of Cryptopsy Infestation, currently with Acurian and Coma Cluster Void. Mike, thanks so much for coming on the show, man. It's a big honor. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to this. Back to, uh, I guess, the beginnings of uh, Infestation and what what were some of your vocal influences at the time? Back then, I mean, I you know, I had a few bands that uh, that I was in prior to that. So, you know, I cut my teeth in the scene um, a few years anyways, you know, played some shows and things like that. Uh, I was in a bit of a hardcore band and sort of a uh, like a thrashy death metal kind of band as well. And uh, uh, once once those bands became defunct, uh, I, I, I joined Infestation, some people I already knew and and uh, I played with them in some of those previous bands as well. And uh, so I guess that was that would have been about 1990 or so, 91, or late 90, 90, somewhere in that range. <clears throat> we put two demos out. We put uh, 92 and 94. We put Visions of Repulsion and uh, uh, Conceived, uh, 94. Um, and we played a ton of shows. We played with, you know, we were, we were playing with a bunch of headlining acts that had come through at that time. You know, I, I think during that period of time, prior to that, and, you know, I was, I was heavily influenced by Max and, you know, and John Tidy and, you know, guys like that. I mean, you know, I was also influenced by people who I couldn't sing, like, you know, like, of course, Bruce Dickinson and, you know, Rob Alvin and stuff like that. I was, listening, you know, listening to a ton of old school metal Dio and things like that. You know, I mean, so I, I think in terms of influence to make me want to sing, <laughs> we're, we're, it was more coming from that side and influence that, that I, you know, I, I looked up to in terms of, you know, uh, musicians and vocalists, uh, absolutely those two uh dave vincent you know people like that uh th those are you know i still think are some of the some of the best voices in uh in, in metal mm. yeah it's it's funny i you mentioned tardy i i definitely kind of noticed that especially in the early infestation days um but uh it's you you always had this very unique i mean obviously your voice but uh um stage presence you know and um just kind of the way you held the mic and uh, that was always interesting to me i kind of i always pay attention to things like that i'm kind of fascinated by people's individual styles and stuff and um but anyway um so how did uh so with the infestation uh, you guys were very active in the early 90s uh how did that kind of transpire to uh, the cryptopsy stuff i mean how who uh how did that get set up i had um I had decided to move up up to Quebec. Um, at the time, Infestation, we had uh, lost our, our guitarist, Eric Barrett. He had, he had quit at the time. So we were kind of in a transition period to figure out, you know, we were looking for guitar players to come in and um, nothing was panning out. This was kind of a short period of time, too. It wasn't like a, you know, uh, it wasn't a long, extended uh, moment or so. It was within a couple of months or so. We were still trying to figure out who we were going to have them. You know, we had we had people come in, ask us to play some shows, and we're like, well, we did play one show as a four-piece. Can we can we pull this off? Do we want to pull this off? And, you know, there's a lot of harmonies and, um, you know, it's doomier kind of kind of stuff. So there was a lot of harmonies that would be maybe missing, you know? So I think at that time, I had said, okay, well, I'm moving up. But look, guys, I'm, I'm willing to to try to make this like a long distance thing. Of course it didn't happen um, for, you know, multitude of reasons, but uh, the band uh, broke up and uh, just happened to be at that period of times. So I, you know, I knew the guys in cryptopsy and I was, you know, I was already friends with them and stuff. So we were talking and Dan had, uh, sorry, Lord Worm had, had, uh, had left the band at that point. And uh, Flo had called me up and was like, dude, I want you to come down and, and, and try out and this all fell within a period of by the time i moved up here this happened within a short period of time too it was probably within four four months or so um maybe even three months that they had asked me to come down so i said well of course you know i want to want to try out for that you know and i was already a fan of the band and knew the guys so it was a you know for me it was an easy transition to, to kind of step in there a lot of hard work busted my ass to learn those songs you know i went in and i think the first the first jam, I had learned two, maybe three songs, a um, couple from None So Vile and one from uh, from the previous record. And, and uh, it might have been actually, you know what, I think it was just the two from None So Vile that, uh, that, that I had, had learned at first. Came in, you know, we played through them, 
several times and I get to see what they were working on for the, for the new stuff. You know, but for me, I had to learn the back, you know, the back catalog uh, before mm-hmm. we start working on the new stuff. You know, there was already two songs written that would be on Whisper Supremacy. But, uh, but, you know, I came in, I, you know, I felt good. I, you know, I prepared for it. So I, I did, you know, I just went in and just laid it all out, you know, and, mm-hmm. uh, and it worked out, you know, they, they, they asked me basically that night, like, okay, so you want to come in, you know, you ready for this? And, yeah, of course I was ready for it. You know, I had already, you know, that, like I said, I had established myself in a Boston scene and, you know, a New England scene anyways, you know, and uh, New York and stuff like this. So, you know, I wasn't a stranger to playing shows. I wasn't a stranger to, you know, not so much touring, but, but, you know, uh, weekend shows go for, you know, two, three nights and play and, um, you know, be in the studio, working in the studio and things like that. So, so it was, you know, I felt it was an easy transition with a ton of work and, um, you know, and, and, super happy i made that decision to come try out yeah you know it's interesting that that album i I remember when i first heard it it was so different because of the mid-range factor of your vocals you know because at that time obviously in the 90s it was about low growls and stuff and which you kind of uh you did that a lot with infestation but i when that album came out it was something about your voice it was so uh I don't want to say hardcore, but it was like a mid range and it just really cut through. Was there something that maybe influenced you along that way that brought that out or maybe in the band, the riffs that were going on? Um, That's a good the, the, the aggression of your voice was definitely different than what a lot of people were doing at the time. It, you know, I, it, that was, I feel that was a natural progression to uh, to the style of music. You know, I, I I remember trying. You know, it's funny you said that. that's a good question. I don't think that anyone's ever ever brought that specific question to the table for me. Um, but I, I do remember practicing the songs and and you know trying to go lower with the songs, which I could do at the time. You know, for sure it was not um, something I, I you know that was that was a miss or anything. You know, but I think as I was doing it. I was like, you know, it, it feels almost like I'm trudging behind on it or something. You know what I mean? Like, so I, so then I, 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 rem- I, rem- I literally remember saying, ah, well, you know, maybe I'll try it with a little bit more, more oomph and a little more, you know, try to be like really, cause it, you know, it's fast music and stuff. Right. You know, and th- th- sure there's tons of breakdowns and things like this, but, but there was, you know, inherently the songs are, are quick and, and, you know, and the time changes happen so fast. And so it just, I adopted that kind of vocal style or patterns with it to to really you know tighten it up <laughs> it was really what it was you know um and then it just i just worked on that and just worked on you know, getting the the strength behind that and and uh yeah it was a natural progression i mean it was stuff i can you know i, I don't want to say it was you know it was that was you know trying something out of the box like I, I it was things that i could do and i was you know working in that maybe working towards that style anyways you know for for other projects things like this you know that we had you know guys i would jam with and stuff like this but but uh but i i really felt that that fit even though it was very different from, from what lord warren was doing but especially for the new stuff it just kind of fit you know mm-hmm. I felt that and i felt strong about that and i didn't feel it was out of place or or anything i knew that there was going to be some naysayers along the way um you know filling filling the shoes of lord worm you know the guy's a, a an absolute legend you know great friend of mine and mm. but you know legend un, undoubtedly and uh to, to come in there i i also did not want to do a remake of what he was doing too you know that was a conscious decision too was to absolutely knock him back you know people has always said oh you know maybe you can you know even guys in the band and at, at the time were like oh maybe you could try a little bit more like this yeah but that's him mm. so i I want to stay clear as clear as fuck away from that, you know, like yeah. I really don't want to sound or do or act or anything that someone else is doing, you know, and that's yeah. not me anyways, you know, it's not, um, I don't, I'm, I'm not a follower in that, in that regard, by well, not a follower anyways, but, but really I, I did not want to do a single thing that he had done and I wanted to create something. And this is, this is a new version of cryptopsy and, uh, and uh, I really felt strongly about that. Yeah, and that definitely worked out to the best. I mean, it's uh, yeah, like I said, it's just it, I kind of equate you to like, you know, how you when you hear a pop singer like Phil Collins or uh, you know, you know it's them mm. when you hear it on the radio, or like Chris Cornell or like 
You're yeah, cool. kind of like you. that. I feel like you're like that with metal and extreme music is, you know, when you hear your voice, you know, it's Mike DeSalvo, you know, it's just that very distinct. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's just something about just, I guess your tone is what I always loved. And um, of course your stage presence too. I, you know, I saw you uh, a couple times back in uh, 2001 mm -hmm. and uh, I was always fascinated with how intense you were and, um, I think the first time I saw you was in uh, Portland, and uh, it was on the on the Neil Bag tour. But uh, yeah. I kept thinking, like, man, you know, just those early years of hearing those albums, and uh, I'm like, I wonder what this guy's like live. And it's just like, <laughs> sure enough, you know, he you're just like a bulldog, just like <laughs> crash on the stage, and uh, you know, definitely still to this day, I still get goosebumps, you know. Uh, remembering those moments and um it's awesome thank you but um but yeah uh can you take us through uh till like and then you'll beg how, how were things going then and uh was there any anything you were listening to at the time or lyrically i'm assuming you you probably wrote a lot of the lyrics on both of those records yeah i did i wrote i wrote uh, on uh and then you'll beg i wrote all the lyrics except for uh back to the worms uh for um for whisper i wrote all of them except for uh white worms and uh, cold aid warm blood uh so yeah so i had cut de blanche for that they they really didn't say a word about a single word that i wrote you know uh they left it with with me which you know i, I that's kind of how i want it you know <laughs> like uh, i want to be able to have that freedom to do that and they really didn't stop anything from you know whatever i brought to the table they they were they were cool with you know um I remember that Portland show, by the way. I remember the club. <laughs> I don't remember the name of the club, but I do remember the I, I do remember the club. I remember the setup of it and how it was, and I, I think and I do recall it being a good show. Uh, Portland was always fun, anyways. I always like uh, West Coast shows were always awesome. And anytime we rolled through there, uh, I can't think of any place. We played Seattle once, and I think it was on that tour. And yeah, uh, yeah and and but Portland, we played uh, on both of those tours for sure and the, you know california san fran and you know the whole west coast really uh uh through la and stuff awesome always awesome shows you know um i, I you're asking me so specifically you're asking me uh how things after whisper supremacy how are things with with and then you'll beg uh with uh yeah i mean uh, boring, uh, i like was always uh, i was always a fan of you know of course tonally your, your voice and your stage presence and all the things being a front man um I, but I always loved the lyricism and cryptopsy because I felt like it was also something that was so, um, you know, at a certain point you kind of get tired of just like the typical gore stuff. And you guys, yeah. uh, I mean, literally the, I mean, just the artwork on, you know, those albums kind of, <laughs> it's almost like it personifies the, the lyricism and, uh, what you're feeling it's you know just life stuff and survival and um uh yeah so i was just kind of thinking like you know uh, how how involved you were with the lyricism and and then into that album uh you know you know kind of what what were things you were listening to or oh sorry that's right that's more yeah. what i'm listening to um <laughs> What the hell was I listening to? We were listening to a bunch of stuff back uh, back then. I, I mean, like you know, the classics. I, I for sure I was listening to a ton of like Neurosis and and uh, Isis at that point for sure. Um, uh, Candaria. We toured with Candaria. I was listening to Candaria for you know years before before we were, were we toured with them. I love that band and that band was uh, uh, exceptional to uh, watch every night too. You know that they they really those guys are unbelievable unbelievable musicians great people too um so i you know at that time i i was i happened to have been listening to a, to a lot of uh candaria prior to that as well um my dying bride stuff like that i mean i'm a big doom guy too so i i you know there's anything that was coming out that was that was related to that for sure i was i was listening to and, and all through i mean i still listen to my dying bride the new stuff the new album and stuff like i you know, really dig that band and love the band from back from back in the day uh especially with when we were with infestation i would say that was a huge a huge uh influence at that time uh we talked about just to bring it back to influences from from them but that was a huge influence for sure with with the whole band them uh anathema bands like that but uh I know that 
Oh, I, you know, I was listening to a lot of like, uh, you know, all, ironically enough, I, mean, I, I listened to a ton of rock and, you know, classic rock and things like that. But at that point, I was listening to a ton of uh, Monster Magnet, actually, because I remember the band, uh-huh. fucking, uh, guys in the band hated, couldn't stand it. I was like, oh, God, do you hate this man? Let me just, you know, I love this band. And uh, yeah, so I know I was, I remember I was listening to a lot of that because they were, they were trying to chicane it. Uh, you know, in the car, in the, in the vans. <laughs> um, and I know there was some other stuff that it, it's, it's hard to place myself exactly, but definitely those, those types, types of bands at that point. Um, lyrically, I think you're right because, you know, lyrically you, you can't go from someone who, um, you know, you talk about like tired, tired uh, lyrics and, 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 you know, and phrasing and wording and stuff like this with, with, you know, a ton of bands will, will do the gore thing. And I, I like the gore thing, you know, I, of course I do. I'm um, big horror, horror movie fan. So you, you can't not like those kind of lyrics and that, but it's not what I'm going to write, you know, personally, you know, Dan would, uh, Lord Worm would write um, more, more so in that, but he'd write it in a, you know, a poetic way, you know? So he was, he was doing that stuff, but you know, the guy was writing leagues ahead of almost everyone, you know, uh, he's a, amazing writer you know <laughs> and um so for myself it was also important to to kind you know some of the songs i brought some of that in uh you know songs like loathe i, I that was a conscious effort to to write in a more more of a style of what he was what he was writing to kind of keep you know keep things a little symmetrical with the, with the changeover um but but then of course it always you know will always come away from that and i'm, I'm gonna put myself into it at that point which which of course it ended up be, you know becoming and it was you're right it's a lot of life sort of experiences and uh you know what was going on in the moment you know what what had gone on in the past potentially what would what could happen in the future and you know and i try to put it i, I always try to put my wording in a, in a in a way that's um not always so evident like i, I like i like when people take time and i do i do this as well not with every single band i mean like you know you can see the bands that you can you can dig into band like deftones uh oh i was listening that that's a band i was listening to a lot of deftones a ton of deftones mm-hmm. i still do i love deftones um but you know you, you you look at you look at uh at, at his lyrics and you don't know what the fuck he's saying until you until you like really dig into it i remember having times when i was reading his lyrics and being like whoa now I get it. And I've read these lyrics like fucking 15 times, you know, and, but now, wow, I actually could, I, I'm, I'm actually feeling exactly what he was, you know, or my interpretation of what he was doing. You know, I always like that is that other people will have a different interpretation of what maybe I was writing or what, you know, Lord Worm was writing or anyone who's writing songs or a lyricist or, mm-hmm. you know, poems or whatever the hell they're writing. There's always going to be that aspect to it. And that's something that I always liked. And that's something that I always try to adopt into my personal writing is that uh, I want people to to think on on those lyrics. If you're if you're a person who's into lyrics, you know, you're gonna read about it and your interpretation, you know, uh, I, and I said this before is I, I've had people come up to me and, be, and 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 say something even as far back as the infestation days, come up and say, you know what, that this song, this specific song, means this to me and it carried me through this. And I and I'm telling you, I this is every city. Every city you go to, or people would send a uh, fan mail, and they would write their own personal experiences based on your interpretations of your songs, and that always that gives me chills just even saying it. Like you know that that to me as a as a writer, you know, is what you want, <laughs> you know, like or I hope that's what people want, you know, it's certainly what I want, you know, and I I I, I, I it, it was always something that I anytime somebody started to talk about that every almost every time their ideas of, of, of those particular lyrics or that set of lyrics or that, that song or that album um, was certainly not what I was maybe feeling, you know, specifically, maybe in a roundabout way, but for them, it, it was, it was absolute for them, you know, and that I think is, is amazing. You know, that's, that's a beautiful part of music and writing is the fact that people do that and it can be something else. It doesn't matter what it is to me. It's what matters to the listener, the reader, or whatever, and I I love that. Wow, well, yeah, I never really thought about that. It seems like with with lyric and communication, it seems like people want to have the same ideas the the writer, you know, and that that is interesting how one idea it, it kind of reminds me of like the police. I think uh, Sting. I remember in an interview he said. Uh, 
every breath you take, you know, absolutely what, what he, the meaning of that song. And then people yeah. are playing that at their weddings and he's absolutely. like, he's like, God help you. <laughs> yeah. That's a perfect yeah. example right there. I've had this conversation with people, that specific song. It's like, it's, it's a dark morose lyrics. You know, it's like, it's dark as possible. And people are just like, ah, da, da. They're fucking <laughs> at their weddings and shit. Dancing and, you know, and it's, it's clearly nothing to do about love. It's, it's a sickness that's going on there with, with whoever, he, whoever that character is, you know, absolutely. Yeah. Good, good point. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's funny. You mentioned the Seattle show. We, I did a, a road trip to see you guys in Portland and Seattle. And that was the first time I ever, the only time I ever staged dive, uh, <laughs> the intro of phobophile i, I didn't push you off did i no no we just i just i was only like 19 at the time i just ran up and god i was like it, those two shows are like the best ever you know because i mean like cryptopsy or you know that era of of that band was just to this day is unparalleled to me you know but um but yeah, I, I love lord worm but um you know something about your voice is just I don't know, like Whisper Supremacy is like the soundtrack of like what I think, you know, the highest point of extreme metal is, you know, and so it's an honor to have you on. Um, awesome. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Can you, uh, I don't know, however much you want to disclose, but um, the departure of Cryptopsy and um, up till, you know, when you started being active again as a singer. Um, you know, well, you know, the departure was certainly not, um, not easy, you know, it was, it was not easy. Um, you know, there, there is several reasons why the, de the departure happened and, and, and it's okay. You know, it, it, I, I can safely say that at the time it was, you know, it was tremendously difficult, but it was, it was the right choice. Um, years later in hindsight, I can, I can see it was the, the right choice at that, at that time, you know, um, it was sort of a perfect storm, if you will, that, you know, made that come to, uh, fruition, uh, you know, and, 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 you know, and, and it happens like, you know, you're, you're a band is a band is like having, you know, four marriages or five marriages going on at once. You know what I mean? Like, and then you've got your, your other marriage, your real marriage, you know? So you've got all these conflicting things going on. And sometimes it's, it's, it's a lot, you know, it's a lot to, a lot to, to navigate through and um you know it, it leaving was 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 a was a huge step in my life you know because i was you know we were very active at that time and and i i would venture to say we were you know maybe we were right at that like next step you know i felt like you know there was enough momentum there that it was really things were going to take off um but you know it, it shit happens and and we move forward and that's that's exactly what all of us did, you know, as, as Cryptopsy as a band and myself as a, as a musician moved on. And, uh, you know, there was, there was a, a stretch of time. I didn't, I never stopped playing, you know, like I stopped playing shows, um, except for, you know, going up and, you know, you know, doing a, doing a song with the band or whatever like that, or doing a, going in the studio and recording a song, things like that. But I, I, the, from that, from, from the, from the ending of that particular situation, um, I was playing with, you know, I was playing with my buddy, Mike from infestation, the drummer for infestation and, and, and drummer for war horse. I was, you know, playing with my wife as well. We were doing, you know, some psychedelic, um, stone or rock kind of stuff that we, you know, we recorded as a project that I had, that was, uh, that we had, that was called Mabus. And, uh, I had a studio in my house. So this was really an adventure into something that I had never done. It was a lot of clean vocals with heavy vocals and stuff like this, but it's, it's, you know, it, it, it some of it's heavy and some of it's straight rock, straight Southern, almost Delta blues kind of shit, you know? And that was really eye opening ex experience for me as a musician to, you know, to, to say, okay, all this stuff that I've done here, now I can just loosen up the valve and, try something on this side that is completely that nobody fucking has ever heard before for, you know, from me anyways, you know, or, you know, from, from Mike too, as well, you know, my wife, my wife Genevieve as well. And that was a lot of fun. We did that for years. We'd get together on the weekends and just, just play and fuck, man. I, I, I adore those songs. You know, I really do. Um, it's one of the most meaningful, ironically enough, it's one of the most meaningful 
uh, period of songwriting that that I've ever had, uh, if I'm being perfectly honest with you. Um, and nobody's heard it, you know, or very, very few people have heard it. You know, it's 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 like uh, it's the computer. It's on the computer and, you know, a few of my friends have some CDs and shit like that. It's, you know, eventually I'll probably, eventually I will release them. Um, but not now, you know, I'm not ready for it right now, but, uh, but they are great songs, you know? Um, and then, you know, for, through there, it just, you know, I had a few bands that had tried to, you know, uh, see if I was interested to, to, uh, to, to sing for them and stuff. And it just wasn't, wasn't the right fit in my mind. Um, I was gracious that people were still actually, you know, still interested in that. You know, you know, the music metal scene is very fickle, you know, so as soon as you're out of it, it's you're out and that's it. Um, and, and in many ways, all, a lot of my contacts, there was, there was a stretch of, of time where a lot of my contacts just absolutely fucking disappeared. I didn't hear from anyone, you know, and I had even reached out to some, some of my, uh, of my, my deeper contacts to say, I have this Mobus project and, you know, would you be interested in it was just kind of like, it's not, you know, this isn't, I, I was expecting whisper supremacy. Well, no, it's something completely different. It's the name isn't fucking cryptopsy on there or manifestation you know, <laughs> or, you know, it's Mappus, you know? So, mm -hmm. so there's a lot of that too, is that you, you know, as a musician and you have some success, you get, you know, I, I hate to use the word pigeonholed, but, but it kind of, you know, there's an expectation that's, that's there from from fans so I, I get it people those fans would have been like the fuck is this I, this is awful you know and i know that you know and, and that's cool but it is was something completely different um <clears throat> you know and then uh it it led up from that point it led up to um you know years later it, it led up to rob uh, rob millie and i you know, rob millie from from Naraxis. uh you know we were friends we've been friends for years it went from from a point where we were, you know, we were chatting. We worked down the street from one another. We started chatting and he started showing me some stuff uh, that eventually became the Acurian project. And, you know, this was, fuck, man, I don't know. Was it 10 years, you know, layover in there somewhere? It was close to that. It was a long time. Um, you know, but I, like I said, I, I, I've always kept it going. I, you know, a bunch of friends that would come together. We jam, we play, things like that. Um, but then this was the first, like, project where it was like, okay, we're doing this for ourselves, but this is something that will be, you know, eventually released to the metal world, you know? And, um, and I think at that time, this was the right time for it, you know, for us to get together and, and start to formulate plans on how we were going to move forward with the Kyrian. And then of course, from that point, uh, you know, it went from, you know, went through coma cluster void and, and, uh, which is still, still active and uncle, uncle Stalin and the communist joy and, and ongoing uh you know i've had a few side projects in there as well you know it, it's never stopped you know still uh, still highly active so the akirian thing came before coma cluster void i think so i'm pretty uh, sure yeah yeah I, I couldn't tell it did, yeah. It, it did yeah <clears throat> it, it, it i mean coma cluster void we put the though that first album mind cemeteries came out um and maybe even the second one came out before before um uh, come forth to me from Akurian, but yeah, Akurian, we were, that was the first, that was the first project. I remember, I remember Rob saying, oh, you're in another project. Oh, that's going to conflict with, I remember him saying that, you know, that's a, that's an honest concern. And, uh, and I said, oh, of course it's not, it's not, you know, we're, we're, you know, and then of course we put two albums out before the Akurian record. It just worked out that way. You know? mm. Yeah. It's funny that God, that coma cluster, man, I have to question, uh, what is the tuning? Cause I mean, that's the lowest, guitar tuning I've ever, I think like I'm not even sure what you're doing that. I'm not sure. It was like, uh, yeah, I was listening to that today and I'm like, my God, I didn't even know that was possible to, yeah, to tune brutal. that low, but it was, it sounds great. You know, it works. But I always wondered like, how, <laughs> you know, yeah, she, uh, Jean is writing some, some nasty, nasty, nasty material. Uh, she really, uh, <laughs> I mean, like I said, when she actually, it's funny when she reached out to me and she reached out to me through her and, uh, <clears throat> and Sylvia as well had reached out to me, uh, through LinkedIn of all fucking places. Like, uh, you know, uh, nobody who the hell reached, you know, who the hell used LinkedIn? <laughs> they found me through that and, uh, had sent me some like little snippets of, you know, 20, 30 second pieces of songs that I don't even know if they were ever used, but I was just, that tone is what sold me, 
the riffs of course sold me but that tone and the and the the completely unique style that she was putting together i was just like holy fuck you know i like i said i just back to what i was saying i had people would come to me but it was it's already stuff uh you know maybe stuff i i done i don't want to i want to do something different you know i I always i want to grow as a musician you know so and this was this was something that i felt there was a tremendous amount of growth possibilities um and what she was sending me in fucking 30 second clips (laughs) and i could tell right away immediately i was like oh wow this is something cool this is something unique something different and um and then it just blossomed from there long distance i've never met them it's crazy are you guys, uh, I mean, with either project, are you uh, anticipating ever performing live or is it not really a concern at this point? Because um, I know you're, you know, obviously you've been kind of uh, as a, not only as a singer, but you just, you've always been very, you know, active as a front man on terms of the stage. And uh, is that something you miss at all? Or do you just kind of love the creation of it and just writing and recording? Both actually, um, you know, I, without a doubt, I, I, I love playing live, you know, it's always been a, a release, you know, and it really, it really is, um, a love of mine, a deep love of mine. Uh, that said though, <laughs> I'm, I'm okay. If I never do it again, <laughs> you know, mm. there's that weird duality, yeah. uh, you know, and mostly because, you know, I'm an, I'm, you know, I'm an older guy now. So to, for me to, for me to go up on stage and this, and this is really a concern of mine, and it has been for a long time is that am I, I don't want to be a half-assed bastardized version of me <laughs> to, you know, go up and, and not put forth the same energy and, you know, the same reciprocation of energy. And I, I you know, that, that's something that I don't want to say it's an anxiety or a fear. It's nothing like that, but it's something that definitely concerns me um, as a musician. I, I, you know, so the, so on the other side of the coin is that I can, I can, write stuff and I can put, put albums together and, and, you know, and there's no concern of that because, you know, there's no, it's just, it's, it's, here's the presentation and everything else that surrounds it isn't there. And I don't have to worry about that. So, you know, so yes, I, I, both of them, you know, I, I, of course I love that, but I'm okay with not playing. And uh, I, for me, I, it's, it's an absolute necessity to still be able to create. And without that, that you know that's I, I can't even see myself in in those shoes of retirement or you know i don't feel like playing or i don't you know I don't, that kind of shit you know but there's times you know it's not like i'm i'm active every single day doing it you know it's not it's not like that um but it is you know i'm a creative guy and i need creative output uh or input you know both and uh i don't know where that ends mm-hmm yeah it's weird too listening to those both of those bands i mean they're uh you know i don't want to say gore guts because you guys are you know the canadian thing but uh the complexity of it you know the riffing and um you kind of don't know you know if if you handed that piece of music to some, even the best guitar player or drummer they were like what the hell you know they it would be a a, a very hard task to memorize you know the sequence of riffs and parts of the songs so i could definitely see that like in a recording scenario yeah think about you it know. in a recording i'm oh, sorry go ahead no no i was just saying like you know a uh, recording and uh you know w- one part to the next even if it's like a seven minute song or whatever and then when you have to actually do it live it's like man um i mean that's a whole different world you know i mean just uh, the sequence of the riffing and um, I'm obviously, you know, this kind of music is not like a a structure where you have like a verse, chorus, verse, chorus necessarily. It's not that no. easy. It's just one thing after another. Um, and yeah, I mean, just that's kind of what I picked up listening to the, both of those projects. Uh, there's so much going on, uh, you know, musically and vocally as well. Yeah, you know, and, and you're right about that. I think you know, even as you know, picture picture putting the, those all that together as you know, whatever you're you're you know, you're the drummer, you're the vocalist, you're whatever, and the amount of time that goes into figuring that those songs out because there is some there's a lot of time. Those aren't like you said, it's not one two three four one two three four at all. You know, never, almost never. So, <clears throat> you know, there is there's so many time changes and there's so many 
you know, the arrangements are so odd and complex and, and, and things like this, that to, to translate that live, it, of course it can be done, but it comes with practice. It comes with getting in the room with people and playing this particular project. We're spread out all over. So for me to go into a room, get together with them over a weekend, once or twice before a show, <laughs> no, no chance. Not, <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't do it. You know, I already know. Yeah. I already know the, the difficulties that would, would be. And, and, you know, and, and of course I'm a guy who likes to prepare. So um, I don't see any chance that the preparation time would allow a, a significantly awesome show to develop from that, you know, and, and that's too bad, but it's just the, the reality where we, you know, they're, they're you know, Gene and, and Sylvia are in Germany and, you know, Lindsay's in Vegas and, you know, Mike, I think is in New York and, you know, Austin's in, actually out by you, I think, or no, maybe Portland. Sorry. I think he's out in Portland. So, you know, to get everyone, you know, to have everyone in the same room is, is not as simple as just a snap of a finger. And then the time to really work, work it so that it's all those little nuances. We're not a half step this way because eh, it'll be fine. No one will catch it. I, I'm not, I don't work like that. You know? So for me, if I'm going to do something live, I want, I want us to be, like the fucking record, you know, like, and that's just me. And I think also anyone who's a professional musician, you know, at the end of the day, that's what you want. You want to display the same thing uh, live as you do on, on record. So don't see that as a project that, that could develop into a live scenario, but uh, a Kyrian, we had talked about it. We had floated around. We had spoken to a few people. We had tried to work out, um, you know, a uh, couple of, couple of shows, a couple of, you know, headlining, we didn't, we didn't want to have, actually, we don't want to headline. We want to, you know, sort of be in that snug in the right before the headline or fine, you know, cause the, you know, we're, we're a studio band, you know, it doesn't matter who's in the band doesn't matter. You know, none of that matters. <laughs> we, nobody knows, nobody's seen us play live. So we're kind of at that beginning stage, you know, with, with that. Um, so for me, you know, we tried to work it out and, you know, there was a couple of situations, you know, we, we want to make sure, obviously you want to make sure it's a, it's um, financially sensible to travel somewhere and, and play a show. And if you're trying to lowball, then like, you know, like I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not fucking 19. <laughs> it's so the, you know, we're going to do this and we're going to put the time in and get ready for these shows. And, and, you know, it's, it's got to make financial sense. Really. That's the hot, that's the fucking deal. You know, any 19 year old that can scoff at something like that, hasn't been in the same situation as, as a musician trying to make, trying to make a living with it, you know? And uh, so, so it just didn't work out. And, uh, and again, I'm okay with that. I think all of us were okay with that. We never went, we went into a Kyrian with the, with the notion of no shows. Um, this was, you know, like I said, just to go back to it is, is, is this was the, this truly was an album that we wrote for us. And if people follow along with that, wonderful and we you know we of course we welcome it we want people to really dig the record and stuff like this but but it wasn't written you know in in any thought of what people were going to think about it or oh you think you know none of this like it was really a record that let's get together we write the record and we see what happens and uh if shows happen along the way shows happen if the shows don't happen no no sweat <laughs> you know really that's what it came down to so we live by that yeah, especially with the complexity of that music. I mean, it's like to get you to play live, it's got to require, you know, a motivational factor of yeah. financial compensation and, uh, you know, and getting everybody together and making sure they're happy. And uh, no, I get it. I yeah, totally what are you going to offer us 300 <laughs> bucks and we're going to spend hours and hours and hours to cut the shit, man? Like, yeah, yeah. The fuck, you know? So, but if you're, if you're serious about it, <laughs> you know, then we'll be serious about it, you know? So that's, you know, it's kind of the way it is. It's, it's, you know, and I know it, it sucks to, you know, maybe hear that or, you know, but that's the harsh reality. And if you think otherwise, you don't know any better. Yeah. And it is sad too, because there's a lot of music now where, you know, people are getting up there without a band and just like a DJ set and they're making yeah. millions of dollars. And yeah. And you think of like, I was listening to you guys today, both Akiri and coma cluster and, um, God damn. I mean, I consider myself a pretty, you know, nerdy musician in a sense of like, I could memorize a, you know, a 10 minute song with classical pieces and all this stuff. But like, when I listen to that, I'm like, Jesus, I mean, <laughs> it, it, you guys are off the wall, like just 
you know, there's like harmonics going on. There's this low tune thing going on with the, you know, whatever, he, whatever the guitar is tuned to. And there's a, your voice and you, you're doing like spoken word stuff and all that stuff. And I mean, I, I'm, I'm actually wondering how the hell did you guys, you know, piece that together in a recording, but then like live, I mean, you know, but yeah, I get it totally. I mean, it's just to bring that to the stage is uh, definitely, uh, there's a lot that needs to happen to make that work out. And, uh, but yeah, I, yeah. I, I mean, I, look, I, honestly, look, we were at that point where we were, you know, we were jamming enough that I mean, we recorded the album live. So, you know, and then, and of course went back and, you know, did overdubs on them and stuff like this, of course, but, but everything that's the, the main vocal tracks, the main bass drums and guitars are all live. <laughs> so yeah. we were, we were, ready we worked our asses off to get to that to that point you know for us it was very important that we did not piece that album together it, that was something that was off the table from the go it was all about for us we wanted an, wanted an organic sound we wanted an organic feel with that and i listened to that record i'm like yeah it's it's organic i mean they, you know they could i i know that there's probably a little some little things that are that are going on that are you know maybe one thing's a little quicker than another thing or something you know like i'm sure that there is i mean, i don't none of us really gave a shit to to like dig into it but it was live it was all live and we we prepared our asses off to to make sure that we were ready and we you know we we recorded that that album was was recorded in one weekend <laughs> you know we did a saturday sunday in the jam room just isolated everything off we had a you know, great uh, engineer, uh, and Alex Ebert, Ebert, excuse me, and um, and he he fucking did wonders with that because we were in a we were in a professional studio, and we were live. You know, and uh, really, I'm super proud of that. You know, I know we all are, all the three of us, the four of us. Sorry. Yeah, man, it sounds uh, the recordings just sound great. The albums sound great, and. Uh... Um, it's really awesome that you're still continuing because there was a while where I'm like, God, what, what happened to Mike? You know, <laughs> and it was cool to see you come back. I was just so thrilled. And, um, you know, and then I found you on Facebook and I'm like, man, that's awesome. I, just, I was just so happy about that and that you're still around and just kind of. Man, we've been in touch for a long time. It's been yeah, years. It's, um, another thing I want to ask you about, too, I know you're kind of a. Um, I'm a beer fanatic and, uh, I know you, you, I saw some of your posts about, you know, stouts. I know you're a big fan of stout beer. Um, and, uh, what, what were you always a stout fan or did you kind of, I, I, I would, I don't know that anyone comes out of the box as a stout fan, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but I, for sure, I, I, I've always had a, um, you know, adventurous side in terms of, uh, you know, I, I was never, a Miller Lite guy or fucking uh, you know MGDs or you know, I'm fine I drank them because that's what it was <laughs> but but I can't say I was like ooh this is wonderful you know it's never I don't think I've ever uttered those words but uh, but you know I think uh, you know it's uh, really where it started I would say is you know you look at <laughs> this is a terrible way to say it started but I, I would say you know going out to like bars and shit like this it was like I'm not drinking this shit anymore it's it's done. And the, at the time when I was going to bars in Boston or whatever, there was like three beers. You, you had all your domestic bullshit, and then you had Rolling Rock, and then slowly after, you had Sam Adams. So I was like, okay, none of this bullshit. Let's try this Rolling Rock. Okay, it's it's better, but it's, you know, it's it's not good, but it's better. And then immediately, as soon as they started having like Sam Adams, and it was just the Sam Adams Boston Ale, and then it went to uh, the lager. Sorry, the lager. Then it went, you know, then they had the ale, and slowly they started adding in different, you know, this fucking hundred beers from them. Um, but I would say Sam Adams is where, for me, the you know the stepping away from your traditional pilsners or ales or lagers. I got out of that. And started to really enjoy some of the, you know, the, the Sam Adams Porter. That's probably the where the, the I would say that, uh, you know, the the love for the darkness started was was the, was that. Uh, there was a there was a couple places that had this on tap, and I, I would exclusively go there because they had it. One, one was a pool hall that we used to go to, and they they had it fresh off off the tap. It was amazing. Then of course, you know, it goes from there, and then okay, oh, dark beer, oh, stouts, oh, and then it just built from there, and. Um, you know, now it's a monster. I, if, if I'm getting, you know, I will drink other beers. So obviously, I, you know, I love, I love IPAs and I love sours and, 
you know, all these types of, I mean, there's so many kinds of beers. Um, but I will always, always, always gravitate to a, to a, any kind of stout. If it's a imperial or a milk or oatmeal or, you know, any sort of porter or Baltic porters and things like this, this is definitely a sweet spot for me. Um, up here, since, since coming back to, to Massachusetts now, I've, um, I've finally been able to go. I don't know if, uh, if you've heard of this one, uh, Treehouse. You heard of Treehouse? Mm. Man, you, I don't know if you can actually get it out there. It, this is They don't even sell it in stores around here. You have to go to the actual facility. The place is like Disneyland for adults that love beer. And, I, and I'm, tell, I'm telling you, this place is fucking massive, and it's beautiful. They've really done something special. You can only go there and get two or three pours. From, mm-hmm. That's it. You go in there and then get the fuck out because we got lineups of people coming in there. You know, that's really what it is. But the place is it's immensely spacious, and they have like these Adirondack chairs that that are that are all over this enormous lot, and it goes up into the hills and and uh, there must be a thousand fucking chairs there that you can go outside, just hang out in the sun, or hang out in the woods and just fucking drink a beers. And um, they every beer that I've had from these guys, and they they're really I think I think they're the best in the business, and. Their stouts are just, it's like drinking a chocolate candy bar. Mm. <laughs> it's, oh my God, it's incredible. Um, yeah, if you check them out, look them up online. Treehouse uh, Brewery, it's it's absolutely tops for me right now. Yeah, best, best, uh, best in the business. Yeah, it's weird. In Seattle, we really don't have like uh, breweries that are kind of, a f- you know, they're not very into the stout stuff you know surprised. A, it, it, a lot of like lighter beers and mostly yeah. wine and liquor but uh um yeah it's every time i go to california i find you know more of a variety um it's, at least with beer but uh you stout guy? Um, i i like stouts you know it's weird in the winter time i get more into stouts mm-hmm. um summertime ipas but i think over the years i kind of like I, I, lately I've just been like Elysian space dust, like, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, cause it's like eight, eight point five percent Uh, you know, I'm, I don't know. I'm like two forty. It's tough to drink in the sun. It's a tough one to drink in the sun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. Stouts are hard for me in the summer, but, um, no, I, you know, my favorite stouts have always been like kind of those espresso chocolate ones. You awesome. Know? Love uh, them. Yeah. And not so much on the sweet side, but more of the dry, like just that aftertaste of like espresso or st- yeah. or chocolate, you know. Yeah. But um, of course, you know the higher the higher alcohol percentage. Like I'm not talking high, high, but like eight to you know seven to eight percent or whatever. Um, that way, I could drink a few of them and get like a yeah. good buzz. I'm not like not too much yeah. sugar, right? Taking the twelve or thirteen percent Imperials and like they're no. knocking your socks off, and you're already like, you know, after after one, you're already ooh. Yeah. Yeah, those Russian ones, man, they're like the Imperial Russian stouts are just too much. Yeah. No joke. I love them, but yeah, you can't drink you them. Like, you you like can't them? take a six pack and like I can't anyways. Uh, I, can't, okay. I can't take a six pack and drink them, you know. If I'm having those, it's like one and it's usually towards the end of the uh, end of the night as like a you know, an aperitif, I guess, at the end of the night. You know, that's I you know, I'll drink I, you know, I want to drink. If I'm out drinking, I want to drink, so I you know, you drink the lighter beers so that you can carry your yourself through the evening and then hit, you know, the, the final punch in the face with a uh, 12% Imperial fucking stout. <laughs> that's, that's a good evening. Yeah. I always, I always kind of get like a headache when I go anything over 10%. It's just, yeah. like, no, I can't do it, you know, but um, I mean, you're a big guy though. You were both, um, I remember walking by you actually when we saw that Portland show, I'm like, damn, that's Mike DeSalvo. And he's just like, <laughs> that big ass like bulldog dude and i'm like i was funny i one of my friends uh we got into the show early and, and uh i was like dude we should talk to mike and uh he like he's like i'm thinking of something stupid to ask him like or something this you know he's like, hey, <laughs> Did you man, come how much me? he's like hey how much is the show and and you were like sitting there like i don't know 12 bucks like <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, oh, your friend, like, like, your friend actually like, asked me that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, you're just like, get the fuck out. Of here. No, was it really? No, 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 no you didn't, you didn't say that. that. That's, 
it never, almost never happens. No, 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 no. You didn't say that, but it was just funny, like how you looked at it. Like I don't know. <laughs> But uh, we were just like thinking of something to say. But I, I just remember walking by you, and you were just like, "Damn, dude, that's Mike Tassel. He's, he's like all big." And but uh, no, I know we're you're a big dude, so we probably can handle some like you know high, the higher percentage beers. But uh, I think like anything over ten, man, I I just you know I'd rather have like five or six uh, beers that are like in the seven eight percentage, you know. So the stouts is like. I don't know. I prefer something less sweet, you know. Um, but then you then you could drink, you know, like the classic. I mean, this is just a go to classic, right? But this this shit's only four point two. You can drink oh even all night. This yeah. smash yeah. music, you know. No, yeah. uh, you like Guinness? I love Guinness. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. <laughs> but you know, I love Guinness in a proper pub with the proper pint glass. That's where I like, that's where I love Guinness, you know, drinking it from here. It's just, it's like, a you know, it's drinking like a bud or something, you know, um, mm. better than a bud, of course. But, but uh, this, you could drink, you know, you, you could easily, I mean, I could, I could tank 12 of these back and feel it for sure. Don't get me wrong. I'll, I'll, I'll be drunk, but it's a different drunk. It's not, uh, you know, stupid drunk. It's fun drunk. <laughs> it's always fun drunk though. <laughs> yeah. No, that's how those, man, those hard, yeah, the stouts. I don't know. Do you so? Do you drink stouts in the summertime as well? I do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We always joke about it too. Like you know, be honest, you know, you drink it really is you know it's you know hundred degrees out, and I'm I got my you know for sure I have uh, eight nine ten percent. Yeah, definitely. But again, uh, it's not the first beer I'm going to go for. If I'm you know if I'm out at a you know yeah on a terrace somewhere and. Uh, I'm certainly going to start off with like whatever they have for sours, you know, like uh, I love sours. I love them. Mm. So a nice 4%, 5% session or, or a sour or something. I, 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 that's where it, where it starts. And then I progress up, you know, then I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not going to go and take a, a triple IPA uh, in the blazing sun. Yeah, ten percent. There's no fucking no chance. <laughs> <laughs> that will make me sick. But uh, but you know later as it, as you, as you progress through the day and you're you know you're sort of um, climatizing yourself with with you know the sun coming down and stuff. Then then I can bring it up. But I'm not, I, certainly not the the uh, first attack of the day. No. Um. We'll probably wrap it up soon. I'm I'm gonna drop some of your links. I wanna I one thing in the back of my mind, um, because you're kind of New England and Canada, is there what's the big uh what are the pros and cons of both? I mean, um I know geographically it's kind of the same side of the continent, but uh I mean music scene, uh food, lifestyle, what are the changes that you've experienced going back and forth between uh you know, uh, um, Montreal and uh, Boston. Food wise, food wise, they both have incredible restaurants. You know, mm -hmm. Boston has top tier restaurants, as as does as does Montreal. You know, really does. Um, scene wise, Boston's always had a strong scene, but nobody has a scene in North America like like Quebec does. Nobody, and that's everywhere in Quebec, you know, but if let's, if we're centralizing it to Montreal, amazing fucking scene, like tr top notch. Oh, I've said it 30 years ago that Montreal is, is the place in North America. You don't find anything like it. The camaraderie between the musicians and, you know, and, and the, the, the fans and just the love of the music, like they're, you know, it's, it's, there's a, uh, a deep love for anything that's metal up there. It's a rock. It's a rock town. It really is. Not that Boston isn't. Boston has always had a great scene. You know, it's had some trouble. It's had some trouble through the years. You know, there's, there's, you know, been there has been issues with you know gang violence and things like this. Um, but you don't see that in Montreal. You know, it's it's very much a, a union between people of all types of music. You know. Uh, rock based, you know, from rock to, you know, to the, to death metal, the grindcore to, to hardcore, you know, it's not the same as it was in, you know, in Boston, uh, maybe that's changed. You know, I've been, I've been away for so long 
Um, I hope it's changed because Boston deserves that. Boston deserves a, you know, united uh, sort of front of, of musicians and, and fans alike, you know, like it used to be, you know, it was great back in the day. And then it's kind of lost its way uh, for, for a few years anyways, you know, um, uh, winter is going to be a lot less down here, <laughs> even though New England went, winters suck. It's nothing like the pile of shit winters that we, uh, that I experienced up, uh, up in, up in Canada. I won't miss that at all. I, I don't like the cold. And um, that's going to be something that uh, whatever I have to endure down here, <laughs> well, I already know there's nothing like uh, like the madness that uh, that happens for six months a year in, in Canada. You know, um, you know, people wise, uh, I, you know, I, th- I, I do think, uh, you know, Americans and Canadians are are different. It's, they're different. You know, uh, I don't I can't pinpoint exactly what it is canadians are very nice and yeah it's fine you know there's no i'm not gonna walk the streets and you know somebody's gonna fucking say something stupid to me it's you know that it just never happened up there it could happen here in the states you know it's it, it definitely it's a little bit more amped up here um you know but but that being said i come home and i'm like oh shit i'm home you know <laughs> it's like feels good but uh being up in canada it's kind of like uh, all right, I know no, no matter where I go, I know there's going to be no shit that's going to happen. Nothing's going down, you know. So there's there's differences like that. Um, you know, the, I I was up there for 26 years, and you know, I, I obviously you learn French, uh, but my French was weak. Um, you know, and I, I have had some troubled situations with with the language, uh, but by and by and large, specifically with the music scene, there was never any alienation that at least that I witnessed any alienation is me being an English um, person coming from this, coming from the States, coming up there and being part of uh, a magnificent scene. Not once that I can recall or <clears throat> never anyone had come to me and say, ah, oh, fucking English guy, you know, coming into to the Montreal scene. Everybody was immensely welcoming. And, uh, and, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm proud to have been a part of that scene for, for so long and to have experienced that because, because the, you know, the, the both English and French metal scene, nobody is a fuck. Everyone's tight, you know, and it's, and it's the way it's supposed to be outside of that. It might not be the same situation. It might not be the same story as much, but within the music scene, it is a, a strong um, um, camaraderie between everybody. And, and really it's, it's, it's um, an honor to, to have spent as much time as I did up there and to be with, uh, with, with, with people who accepted me, they didn't have to fucking accept me for shit, but they did. And, uh, and I, and I, I loved, I love the Montreal and Quebec scene. Love it. I'll love it forever. Yeah. I can imagine the French. I, I heard that French is like one of the top languages that are hardest to learn for English speaking people next to it's like Chinese and like, yeah, yeah, it's not <laughs> tough language, man. Yeah. yeah. But I got by, I can get by, you know I mean? But, but it's not like I'm catching everything and I don't speak it fluently, but it's, over 26 years, if you're not picking anything up, you're a fucking dumbass. you know, like you're in another country and they speak French. You need to, you know, you need to pick up something. And, you know, of course I did, I, you know, I took classes and went to, you know, but generally speaking, I, you know, that I, I would be out with my, you know, French friends and, you know, they would be speaking in French and, I understood at least 50% of what they were saying. You know, I could always catch along with it. And then the, most of the time they were just, oh, sorry, man. And they, they'd switch back over to English, which nobody had to fucking do. But they, you know, they did because they wanted mm-hmm. to include me, you know, and, and, and being part of that and being part of the inclusion with that is is uh, about as endearing as it gets. Yeah, yeah. Just they, uh, they're they patient, yeah. It's, it's like Spanish, I guess, you know, like I, I kind of, I lived in Southern California for a bit and mm-hmm. I used to work at like Subway making sandwiches for people and I would try to speak Spanish to them and like, you know, <laughs> yeah, they uh, appreciate it, people man. just like, we're yeah. like, what the hell is this white boy saying? You know, I'm just saying, like, <laughs> my nasa mostaza, you know, I was trying to speak <laughs> Spanish, but my accent got better and I was learning. Yeah, but at least you tried. Stuff. I tried, but they were like, look at this fucking, (laughs) but, uh, no, I mean, 
it was cool that they kind of laughed at it, but it was like, uh, no, I, it's hard, man. Like I, I see people learn two or three languages and, um, yeah. it's funny cause I hear your accent. I've never talked to you to this extent where I heard your, you know, Boston Tony accent. And, you know, of course the first things that come to my mind are, um, I've never had a lot of friends from Boston, but the movies, you know, like, um, the departed and, yeah. Yeah, you know, just hearing that it's it's funny to think of like going from that badass like like you know um, kind of like East Coast accent to like you know really f kind of I, I mean I don't I don't know what the right word is but uh, French is very s kind of soft you know it's a very it's an elegant language yeah 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 yeah, yeah. it is but that transition I imagine is probably not the easiest thing. No, because what, you know, with the French language, I mean, what you say in English is just flat. This is what it is. In French, there's a big to-do about the explanation of it. So what you'll have to say in, in English in two sentences, French, you might get a paragraph. You know what I mean? Like it's, mm. it's you know, there's a lot more wording to ex to express the same thing that English is very direct with, you know? And, you know, so so to learn that, you know, to, 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 to speak the language, to speak another language in general, I think, you know, I mean, I just, you know, I, I, I speak well in English, you know, and, but I've all, I've never had an ease with other languages, you know, like it's never been, I, I've never been able to just pick it up like this ever. You know, I took Spanish, I took Spanish for four years in high school. And although when I hear it, like I was, I was just working, I was working in, uh, in the city uh, at, a liquor, at, a, at a liquor store, actually. And uh, a lot of Spanish people come in there, the Dominicans and um, South Americans that come in there, there's a, a ton of Central Americans and stuff. They come in and they generally don't speak English. So I'd, I'd hear it and I'd hear them speaking. And I was like, fuck, man, like I'm actually picking up on some of those conversations. It's funny how like, all it's lying, it's, it's, it's laying dormant, lying, lay, laid, it's laid dormant for, for so long. And then still, after all those years, I'm like, fuck, I, I actually picked up what this guy just said, you know? And, um, you know, but French is the same thing I hear when, and, you know, being in New England is get a lot of French here. And I've heard it multiple times since I've been there. And right away, I'm just like, oh, I could actually talk to this guy because I understand everything he just said, you know, but of course I don't. But, you know, I, actually, it's not true. I have I have spoken French to a few people and they're always they're always like, ah, oh, fuck, you know, because nobody speaks French down here. You know, if you're from here, you know, the old time is due, you know, because because um, in New England most of my friends are French heritage here. You know, the, 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 the French came down and um, into uh, Vermont and into uh, New Hampshire, specifically in Maine and stuff like this. And I know a lot of, a lot of my friends, their parents all spoke it fluently parents and grandparents. They didn't teach it to the kids, you know, same with, you know, same here. I am, you know, I'm Italian and my, my father speaks Italian. My grandparents of course came from Italy. My father came from Italy. I don't know, fuck all in Italian. It's like it becomes lost if, you know, you just, it's, it's America. So it's, you know, like uh, the languages do get lost. But, uh, but, but it's, it's cool to see that, you know, that a lot of these, a lot of my French friends, they, they grew up around, a lot of my French friends from here grew up around the language. They just didn't pick it up. Yeah. God damn. I mean, yeah, the East Coast, I mean, think like, everything from Europe kind of came over there first. So there's probably so much culture there and so much that you have to adapt to. And, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the language thing is interesting. I, I think like, that's kind of where I push myself to learn other languages like Spanish and German and stuff. Cause I thought like, you know, if I can master like three instruments, why can I do two languages? When you look at like someone that you're working with at a restaurant knows, yeah. knows how to do that and it's like yeah. you kind of feel inadequate and and uh you know you pursue it but it's just god it's so hard um i mean it takes dedication it, like like a, music, like, like a musical instrument that's all it is it just takes the dedication the practice and it really uh, yeah or it. or maybe just being desperate you know if you have to go to a country and learn how to survive you have to learn how to uh speak their language you know and um maybe I guess like, at least for me, I, I just never been desperate enough to like, I have to learn this language or I'm going to die and I can't survive in this country. Yeah. You know, it's like when you go to like Europe and 
I, I toured Europe once and it was like pretty much everybody spoke English, like yeah. whether it was in Spain, Portugal, yep. or um, Germany. I think the only country I remember that English was, God. Um, <laughs> actually, you know, it's funny. I can't even really think. I most of the countries spoke English pretty well. Maybe yep. I, I would say maybe France though. We had a day off in Paris and um, yeah, I remember I went right by the Eiffel Tower and I got lunch and like, you know, cause you know, in Europe they don't tip, we don't tip, you know, it's like they already, they don't expect tips like in America, nope. but um, I gave him like a fat bill and I'm like, you know, he said, uh, merci. And I thought he said receipt and I said, sure. <laughs> And he said, thank you. He took my like hundred dollar euro. <laughs> so it was like, like uh, I don't know how much this is worth. <laughs> take it. <laughs> yeah. So that was like, I'm like, France, man, that's weird. It was, you know, this is like downtown Paris. And I'm thinking like, yeah. So there's some countries where maybe the English is kind of, they don't, they don't do it. But most, you know, I think if you're English speaking, you're, we're pretty lucky that we don't have to learn, you know, we don't have to go through that, but like if you're, I've worked in restaurants, you know, with people like from the Honduras and stuff like that, and they they have to learn English. I mean, mm -hmm. and and their life depends on it, or they're gonna yeah. die. They they you can't get work, you know. So yeah, that could be it too, you know. But um, I, I, I um, just to speak on on France, um, you know, I, I, I was fortunate to play many cities in France, and um. You do get you do get some of the people. I, they were doing it to the my, you know to the guys in Cryptops who speak fluent French. You know they're French, <laughs> so and they were they were guys that would come out to. I remember ordering beers, and um, them saying something as simple as uh, you know un, uh, un beer, you know one beer. So the guy would be like, "Quoi? You know, what?" And he'd say un beer. He'd say oh un beer. <laughs> so they it was just like a, 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 a just the way that. They said it because it's it's Quebec French, so it's it's like it's like English is bastardized from from Britain. Quebec is like bastardized from from France. At least that's how they see it, right? So because the 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 intonation is uh, a bit different, the guy was hopping on that. You know damn well what a beer was, but he still hopped on it and gave them shit for it. <laughs> it was like wow, you know. But uh, but that was outside of like the metal scene because the metal scene. Those people were, you know, I, 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 I at the time that I was that I was touring, uh, you know, I'd speak to them in broken French. Like anytime someone would come to me and, and speak to me in French, or, you know, if I understood it or I didn't. But then I try to talk to them whatever whatever French I knew. I'd try to talk back, and and it was it like it is in Quebec. It was always them reciprocating it in what they knew in English. So there was always a little give and take to to say, okay, well, I'll show them. But I'll show him what English I know, and I always tried to do the same with 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 people in France, everywhere in France, uh, that was in, within within the metal shows, you know, just to speak to them in whatever broken French I could. And man, fucking people love that, you know, like uh, all both, you know, I'm, the guy speaking English, he's taking time to speak English. He doesn't speak English ever in his life. He's taking time to show me what he knows in English, and vice versa. Here's an American coming in here, doesn't speak French, and uh, he's trying, you know. That's all it takes. Uh, you break barriers with that. Yeah, man, that's it's, it's really interesting. I'm glad to hear other people's uh, experiences with that, especially because I was really fascinated about you being on the East Coast and just uh, so involved with you know Canada and Montreal and going down to uh, back to Boston. And um, I always kind of wondered about that, you know, that that fine line of customs and just you know etiquette and i don't know culture i mm -hmm. guess but um uh i don't want to keep it too long but uh can we plug some of your sites so i know uh akirian.bandcamp.com we got Correct. coma cluster so that's where you can go and buy your guys music um i know an instagram akirian official is the instagram handle um, do you guys have an Instagram for Coma Cluster or a face? I, I'm sure you guys are on Facebook. Yeah, it is, and I think it's I, I think it's just Coma Cluster Void. Maybe it's official or something. That's terrible. I'm terrible with this shit. Fuck. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, I believe it, you can just put Coma Cluster Void. You're gonna find them for sure. Uh, I don't know how active she is on it, but uh, she was she used to be pretty active on it. But uh, I don't know if she's super active on that anymore. She's more active on on Facebook. Uh, of course, you can catch both 
both Kieran and uh, and and Coma Cluster Void uh, on and Uncle Stalin and the Communist Joy as well. You can find on there. Um, infestation too. There's an infestation page if, uh, that's still active. I don't know how much is put on there. I don't. Um, I don't have access to it, but, uh, but it's there, you know, and then my own personal page too. Uh, you want to find, you know, you can come to Mike, uh, it's Michael DeSalvo on, on Facebook. I fucked it up with Michael. (laughs) So, uh, it's Michael DeSalvo there. And then on Instagram, it's Mike DeSalvo. So, yeah. And, uh, I'm sorry. I I know the (laughs) uncle Stalin thing. What's this about? Like, I, I missed that. Dude, this <laughs> this is gonna blow doors off of fucking people uh, people's houses uh, for sure. It's actually uh, it's um, it's a project with uh, Matt Barraby from uh, Terramobile, mm. and um, he was in um, yeah he's in Terra and um, Unhuman uh, with uh, with uh, Yuri Raymond for you uh, you played with he was playing bass with uh, with Cryptopsy. Mm. <clears throat> um, Crazy, crazy technical shit. Both bands, very technical. Uh, and then Alex Eber, uh, Eber, who who had done the um, uh, the engineering for the Akurian record, he plays bass on this project. He plays a six string, I think. And then uh, uh, Patrick Hamlin from uh, from uh, Gorgets and uh, uh, and uh, uh, Matsir uh, from from Quebec. Uh, fantastic fucking drum, amazing drum. The kids. Kids a fucking animal, so we're we're putting it's it's they're waiting on me at this point. Basically, is what what's going on there. Uh, I just have to finish up uh, four songs at this point, and uh, once I get myself organized here, then uh, I'm going to finish those. That's a priority for me to get those songs done, and then we're going to start shopping it. It's it's lunacy, but it's it's madness, <laughs> but it's also really fucking groovy, and uh, I can't wait to you know to it it's it's really cool it's cool that's how i'll leave it at that and uh these guys are just fucking incredible really incredible musicians and uh you know it's an honor to to be playing with them yeah so i'm looking forward to finishing that up and getting that record out so this is your newest endeavor uh that's the newest one yeah yeah Mm -hmm. yeah and that so that and then we're working with the coma cluster boy we're working on the uh the uh, the follow-up to thoughts from a stone so uh, the album's going to be called Absurd Romanticism. And mm. uh, we've got two songs. We released a one song, Plague Devourer. And uh, we got another song that we're going to release as well. And then uh, we have to finish that record up <clears throat> from that point. So it's 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 a matter of completing, I, I think, about another eight songs uh, for that record. And then complete the four songs. It's going to be for the Uncle Stalin and the Communist Joy. That's going to be a six-song 30 20 28 minutes 26 minutes somewhere in that range so it's a mm. bit longer than an ep but uh it's it's some powerful powerful stuff really uh, really strong shit lots of lots of cool grooves uh but not a groove band <laughs> it's a dissonant groove band if, yeah, yeah 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 you've always had a really good something about your style is very groovy and uh i mean you seem like you you kind of can do everything you know the real fast aggressive stuff and um you know uh, that, that's also another thing i always liked about a lot of your music is just how you could fall into those grooves and just be kind of bluesy in a way like a death metal blues kind of singer and then mm, like go cool. aggressive you know so <laughs> um cool man well so uh we know we can expect some more from you as far as uh, the coma cluster stuff and uh the communist joy project and uh i hope we plug most of those sites i know there's so much uh, i i can't even keep track now i'm starting to get dizzy <laughs> with like facebook TikTok, and like 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 linkedin <laughs> i don't know like I, did i miss something here like <laughs> no I, i'm trying my best you know it's like i i always make notes before um i do my podcast with uh sites you know usually i, I now i'm you know, I'm pretty good. My memory, you know, I'll just memorize it, but, uh, it's like, God damn, it's like, <laughs> yeah. tell me, like, like a dozen <laughs> fucking things, you know, <laughs> like, um, but no, man, I, you know, that's what we're here for is I want to, I want to promote and, uh, you know, big fan of your work and, uh, Thank Mike, you. Mike, thanks so much for coming on, man. It was a, a very big honor and, um, been a long time fan and, uh, I uh, wish you well, buddy. Thank you so much, man. Uh, Luke, I really appreciate it. Uh, it's been uh, been a blast, and uh, anytime we'll uh, we'll do it again. 
Take care, brother. You too. Cheers.